Hello friends and special hello to all enemies out there. How are you doing? In the previous episode we designed an awesome looking touch joystick and in this episode we will take a look on how we can prepare our code for creating an enemy class and adding an enemy to the game. We start by opening the game class. What we want to do is to create a new game object which is why we go to the constructor and write enemy equals new enemy. Leave the constructor of enemy empty for now and create field enemy. Then hit alt return and create class enemy. We want to use the player class as a cheat sheet for how the enemy class will look like. To make it easy for us we can split the editor vertically and place the enemy class alongside the player class. So now we have to be really clever and think of what it is that makes an enemy different from a player in our game. The reason for finding similarities is that we can take all features that are the same for the different classes and place them in the same parent class that we inherit functionality from. I know this sounds a bit confusing, but you will soon understand what I'm talking about. One thing that the player and enemy class have in common is that they are both objects in our game. So we can make a new class and call it game object that can later be inherited by the enemy and the player class and all other objects we will create in the future. We also change the modifier to abstract. When using the abstract modifier, we restrict the class such that it can no longer be initialized as an object. Instead, another class must inherit the abstract class, which can then be initialized as an object. An analogy for explaining this concept is that we can think of a car model, let's say a Volvo XC40 from 2019. We could think of this object as a specific release from 2019 of the model XC40, which is of brand Volvo, which is a car, which is a ground vehicle, which itself belongs to the broader class vehicle, which is a kind of world object. In the same way, we can have a specific model of a boat, which is a water vehicle, which is also a vehicle, just as the car, and is thus also a world object. So in a sense, everything that exists in the world shares some properties, which make them distant relatives in some way. And this is also true in Java. Every class in Java automatically inherits a base class called object. Back to the game. We will take everything out of the player class that we want to have shared amongst all game objects. We start with the position and velocity fields, but we leave the radius and the paint, since it's not obvious that all game objects have a radius and a paint object. A game object could for instance be a square, with for instance an image instead of a paint object. Then we make a constructor in the game object. We look at the player's constructor and see that the initialization of the position could be abstracted out and put in the game object's constructor. But if we look at the initialization of the radius and paint, we realize that we need to leave them where they are, since those fields are part of the player class and not of the game object class. Next, we think of the draw method and realize that we need to be able to draw all kind of objects. So we copy and paste the draw method head in game object. However, to draw something abstract is really hard, unless you are Jackson Pollock then it's really easy. So what we can do is make a draw method abstract by adding a modifier to it. The abstract modifier forces all derived classes to implement the abstract method. This means that the derived class must write a method with the same name, input arguments and return type as the abstract method. But the body can be implemented in any way you like. Next, by looking at the update method, we understand that all game objects need to have an update method but the update procedure looks different for all game objects. So we make also this method abstract and keep the implementation in the player class. But oopsie doopsie whoopsie, the joystick argument in the player class violates the abstract contract since the abstract method doesn't have an input argument of type joystick. We must therefore get rid of the joystick argument and find a new way of accessing it. But we are smart, so we immediately decide to add a joystick to the constructor argument list. Now we can extend the player by game object and what we discover is that there is no default constructor in game object. What this means is that when we initialize the player class, the compiler will try to call a constructor with new arguments in the parent class, that is the game object class. But we have no constructor without arguments in the game object, so we have to specify that we want to use the constructor we have that takes the position in x and y's input arguments. We do this by writing super and passing the position variables. You can think of the super keyword in the same way as the this keyword. 
In the player class, the this keyword refers to the current instance of the player class and the super keyword refers to the current parent or super class game object. But what we now discover is that the fields are no longer recognized by the player class. And this is because the private modifiers in front of the fields shield the variables from the derived classes. In order to inherit the fields, we need to change the modifiers to protected, which protects the field from being accessed outside of the derived class, but they can be used freely inside of the derived class. The last thing we need to do in this player class is to store the joystick. So we write this.joystick equals a joystick and click create field joystick. Now, my dear enemies, we are done with our first abstraction. But wait a second. If we look at the variables in the constructor, it seems as though all radius and paint related variables are used inside the draw method, which draws a circle. So in fact, what we have is a game object, which is a circle and also happens to be a player controlled by a joystick. So what we can do is to make an abstract class called circle, which extends game object. We we'll hit alt return and let the editor create a constructor matching the super. Then what we have to do is to once more go through the player class and abstract out everything that is related to being a circle. We can let the speed constants and the joystick stay in the player class, but we need to cut and paste the radius and paint fields and also change the modifiers to protected. Then we cut and paste the radius and paint related statements and we also change the constructor so we get access to the context, the radius and the color of the circle. We then move the getColor method outside of the circle constructor and instead pass the color to the super constructor. We first pass the context and then the context context.compat.getColor method. Now after recording, I see that the context variable is useless for the circle class since it's only used for accessing the color resources in the play class. But no worries, we can change that in the future. And finally, we also add the radius as the last argument. Continuing down the code, we see that the draw method implementation calls the method draw circle, which is very typical for circles. So we cut and paste the whole method. The update method is updating the velocity and position of the player. And at least the velocity updates are specific for the player class, but the positional updates should perhaps be placed in their own method, which then could be extracted out to the game object class. But since we aren't sure, how we will handle this uh, velocity and position updates in the future. We can leave them as they are and revisit them later if need be. As a finishing touch, we will add some class, method and code descriptions. We start with the player class where we write player is the main character of the game which the user can control with a touch joystick. The player class is an extension of a circle which is an extension of a game object. Then we make some comments in the update method saying that we update the velocity based on the actuator of the joystick and also write update position above the position expression. It's a very good idea to write description and comments. One advantage is that it's easy to go back to all the code and quickly get up to speed and understand what it's doing. And it's also important if many people are working on the same project. An even more important advantage is that you force yourself to think what the actual purpose of your class or piece of code is if you cannot explain what purpose your code have, then it's likely that it serves multiple purposes, which introduces complexity in your project. Therefore, try to have a clear purpose for each class, method, and even block of code. Now, we head over to the circle class and write in our class description that circle is an abstract class which implements a draw method from game object for drawing the object as a circle. And we can also group the paint statements and write set colors of circle. Then we go to the game object class and write in the class description that game object is an abstract class, which is the foundation of all world objects in the game. That was it for this time. I feel a bit sorry for not making any functional advances in the game in this episode, but all these changes will simplify the implementation of new objects in the coming episodes. Thank you so much for watching. In the next episode, we will implement the enemy class and add the enemy to the game. See you in the next episode and don't forget to like and subscribe or you will forever be on my enemy list.